Welcome to the Arts and Antique Radio Show, where your host, nationally recognized certified appraiser Elizabeth Stewart, Santa Barbara's treasure sleuth, will help you put a value on the treasures in your own home. Every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? So let's find out. How valuable is it? Three, two, one, you're live. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of Everything Valuable and Beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart, and happy holidays, everybody. This is a crazy week in the art world because there's a lot of shows that are um, kind of either opening or closing, and there's a lot of tumult around the auction markets because they kind of go quiet. Uh, and they post their results. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about some interesting stories. The first story I have for you, Richard, I know you're a dog lover. Oh, yes. So l let's let's think about this. This is a little pit bull, and his name is Van Gogh. <laughs> I hope he has both ears. Uh, no, he has one ear. No! And, yep. And the reason he has one ear, you're quick with that, because I didn't get it. They named him Van Gogh after they found him hiding in a drain because he had been used as bait in a dog fighting ring. Oh, and he, yeah. And he was bruised and bloodied and he had uh, kind of the one ear had to be removed. And he was, you know, thought that he was not going to make it. Um, but a, an organization called Happily Forever, forever, if you are ever, <laughs> We're at the Happy Leaf Forever in Connecticut. And the owner of that organization was looking at shelter dogs online and she was trying to pick a dog for her own um, shelter herself. And she found the Van Gogh and she the, the look in his eyes and the one year named Van Gogh, et cetera. Um, and it's interesting how these people... Um, start these organizations like Happily Forever. I know you were interested up at the ranch in starting something like that, Richard. Mm -hmm. She she did that. She founded Happily Forever um, because her pit bull, Tyler, uh, passed away. And she, she felt, to, you know, all these people don't really understand pit bulls. They've got a bad rap. Yeah. And so she founded a shelter just for pit bulls. Anyway, so she looked and she saw, oh, there's there's this little dog named Van Gogh. He has one ear. I'm going to pick him up. So she drove to North Carolina and uh, she saw uh, saw little Van Gogh. And here's another fun thing that you should know. There is a program of concerned pilots dog-loving pilots of private planes, and the not-for-profit is called Pilots and Paws. And oh, wow. these, isn't that cool? The, the, these pilots volunteer, like, for example, if there's a disaster, a hurricane, fire, et cetera, or something happening in the world, they'll volunteer to go pick up the stray dogs. Uh, and so they're, you know, these Pilots and Paws planes. So she enlisted one of the pilots she knew to pick up Van Gogh, and she was preparing a place for him back at her shelter in Connecticut. So he was traveling from North Carolina and he came off the plane wagging his tail and he was so excited because he had a sense he was coming home. So this lady who run, ran the shelter, she put him with a foster family. And in the meantime, she was looking for adoptions. And she was looking to see who could adopt Van Gogh for permanent. She, she she had no interest for four months because he was a pit bull. Uh, so she decided to do something clever. She squirted some paint on a canvas. She sealed the paint in a plastic bag. She made a small hole in the bag. She spread peanut butter on top of the bag. And sure enough, Van Gogh began lapping up the peanut butter. And as a result, smearing the paint on the canvas he created this design now because the dog was named van gogh in that plastic bag were two colors there's two colors that van gogh is, is famous for richard what are those colors think about starry night the painting I'm, think, starry I'm thinking blue and yellow 
Yes. <laughs> yes. So here's the, the little pet pit bull named Van Gogh, and he's licking the peanut butter off a pierced bag of paint, which contains blue and yellow paint. The um, fast and creative tongue of Van Gogh uh, set up an incredible canvas, and um, she recorded this. She played it for uh, fa on Facebook, TikTok, etc. You know, artistic dog needs adopted, needs home, needs permanent home. Well, the dog um, had a number of interested parties, and uh, the 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 shelter owner decided, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a celebration gallery hanging. So she was going to do an opening. So Van Gogh, with his budding art career, painted a number of canvases. <laughs> and she decided, you know, let's have a Van Gogh show to benefit happily forever. Well, at the same time, let's show him to the world. We're going to tape this and let's show, show him to the world. You know, increasing the chances for uh, forever home for him. Well, she writes that the dog was excited for an art opening. Mm. He was decked out. He had a little bandana on with the starry night image. Uh, he waited patiently on the deck for his guests to arrive. Um, but only two people showed up. They didn't believe this was actually an art show. <laughs> but however... Because the, the, the owner of Happily Forever was recording this, 30 pieces that Van Gogh, the dog, had painted sold out. He received 10 commissions. Now, the, what happened was a number of, uh, uh, of well, the video went viral. And uh, it, 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 at one point, it had 300,000 views on TikTok, for example. Um, she raised $3,000 by selling uh, the, the, the paintings that the dog had done. And one of the volunteers at the event, at the art opening event with Van Gogh, adopted him. And Van Gogh now has a forever, a forever home. Oh, man. So, yeah. Um, and, and here, I don't know, Richard, if you can see it. Here's a picture of Van Gogh at his art opening. There oh, is cool. Yeah, yeah. Here. There's the paintings in the background. Uh, that's the dog at his art opening. And he now has a forever home. Um, I think it's kind of a cool story. I, I think I, other... I love the fact that uh, he, he really started to love doing it. I mean, I don't know. If, did she continue using the peanut butter through each oh, of these? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 so he, I, I would take it, he probably knew exactly what was going on after a while, saying, sure, I'll do that for you. Just make sure there's lots of peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, apparently he's still painting. Oh. So, oh. yeah, so, yeah, it's, pre it's pretty in interesting little story there, Van Gogh, the one-eared artist dog. Okay, we've yeah. got to go to a quick break. When we get back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit about the story of Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of the most valued painters mm -hmm. Uh, ever <clears throat> and what's happening with his art um and what's happening with his former apartment it's a really interesting story don't turn that down back in a sec <laughs> What's that? This? The newest online business banking around. Can you initiate wires and approve transfers? Yes. Pay bills. Check. Cash management. Of course. All business, all online, all on your phone. You bet. My computer, too. It's well, we're probably going to have a fairly quiet Christmas, too. You know, I've already bought her a Christmas present back in November. Uh, she lost a pair of pearl earrings uh, when she went through one of her medical procedures and has been looking everywhere for him, couldn't find him. So I thought, okay. So I went over to the pawn shop over here. They were having a 50% off sale. So <clears throat> I've, I've been wanting to get them appraised. Uh, I know you don't do jewelry appraisal, so you do art. Uh, these are pretty pearls, though. But um, anyway, so, um, you know, five, they were $500 uh, earrings. At least that's how they had them listed for $250. So I figured, okay, and uh, hopefully she'll like them. <laughs> 
well, at least you got that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a nice, uh, uh, I got a nice paycheck, so to speak, from uh, from Jeremiah Higgins, who I do work for back in February, right after Thanksgiving. And I decided that, uh, you know what, I, I need to do this. Of course, uh, she's, you know, what I'm going to try to do is, is pull out of what we do have, like maybe $200 to give to her if she still wants to, to go wherever she wants. I'll give her the truck and the keys and say, hey, here's 200 bucks if you want. If not, that's fine, but you don't have to. I don't, I don't really need anything other than you and the family that we've got. And, uh, you know, or we can, you know, whatever. But um, I'm just because she was very upset when I left this morning saying, are you coming home at noon? Tears coming down. I said, no, oh, I no. won't be home till like tonight. Cause I have a dress rehearsal and a performance dress rehearsal at three and performance at seven 30. And so anyway, we're coming back. <laughs> three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. We're talking about the end of the year art, shenanigans going on in the art world <laughs> i like that just, shenanigans or art shenanigan we just <laughs> talked about van gogh the uh the dog that painted um with a palette similar to um vincent yeah uh, and, I, and I, how how that was such a good story because he was actually adopted yeah. for his you know his celebrity status richard you were going to say yeah, something i was just going to say that i have a a, a a a sort of a warm feeling for the van for van gogh and starry starry night because um uh not that i've ever stood at it stood in front of whether it be a copy or whatever uh and stared at it and just kind of mused but i had a girlfriend back in my early late teens early 20s after i got out of college who had put together this uh, presentation with the song Starry Starry Night, and it was all about Van Gogh. Uh, and so uh, every time I hear about Van Gogh and Starry Starry Night, my mind goes back. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's nice, fond memories of, of Van Gogh and his uh, one-eared uh, uh, extravaganzas that he put out. So what is the next on our agenda here? Okay, so this is a story, a uh, little bit story about Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, now he li he was a, he didn't live very long. It was a tragic short life, 1960 to 1988, um, and he was a great, great, great artist. He was a good friend of Andy Warhol's, and he lived in Greenwich Village. Uh, what was interesting about that from 1983 to 1988, uh, he was kind of searching for a place to live. Um, and, you know, Greenwich Village, it was semi-affordable at the time. Andy Warhol had a former stable in Greenwich Village that he'd fixed up to be sort of a townhouse flat. Um, and he said to Jean-Michel, go ahead and move in there. And he did. So um, there's a today there's a, a, a plaque that marks the the, the, the apartment. Um, and the plaque reads as follows, from 1983 to 1988, renowned artist Jean-Michel Basquiat lived and worked here in a formal stable owned by friend and mentor Andy Warhol. Basquiat's paintings and other work challenged established notions of high and low art, race and class, while foraging a visionary language that defied characterization. And his work is sort of semi-graffiti work. It's, it's very interesting. Now, this apartment in Greenwich Village uh, is for rent, and it's, it's gathered a lot of interest in the art world because Basquiat is, is, is sort of a wonderful, wonderful poster child for alternative art. He started out in his artistic career as one half of the graffiti art duo called SAMO, S-A-M-O. Um, but, you know, the tradition of, of graffiti art it has its supporters, but it also has its, uh, you know, people that just will not have that stuff on their buildings. And um, the particular apartment that John michel lived in that was uh, Warhol's apartment complex, it is absolutely covered with graffiti in the style of Basquiat. Um, so... You have to be a certain type of person to want to rent this place. 
Uh, not only that, you have to have some money. Um, so there's been a couple of people interested in, in this apartment, but you know, the issue is that some of the people interested are, have said, you know, fine, you want to rent it to me. You scrub off, you know, the, the words, you scrub off the graffiti. I'll, I'll, I'll pay, uh, 51,000 a month, 51,000, Richard, 51,000 a month, uh, plus taxes. Uh, the taxes monthly are 9,000. So, you know, you're talking a lot of money to rent this place. So if you want to live in a sterile neighborhood, uh, writes one of the owners, you know, you're not going to want to live in, in John Michelle's old apartment. Uh, and so it is right now, if you're interested, uh, it's 6,600 6, square feet. It's available to anyone willing to pay 51000 a month plus 9000 in taxes each month. And you can... Look it up in the Daily Beast if you're interested in Jean Michel's apartment. Um, also, uh, Jean Michel is being celebrated in an exhibition today at Chess Chelsea's Starrett Lehigh building. And it, it looks at Jean Michel's life through artifacts from his estate. Um, and I think this is super interesting because. Warhol back in the 80s had uh, had a number of openings like this because Andy had just trailers, you know, the back end of, of um, trucks that those storage units just full. He had, I think, like eight, 18 of those. Oh, wow. Filled with, yeah, filled with collections. Wow. I know. And a couple of museums curated, you know, Andy Warhol's collections. And likewise, What's happening now uh, is that um, an exhibition at Star at Lehigh Building in New York uh, is a Jean Michel Basquiat's rare artifacts that he collected in his short life, uh, artifacts from his estate. By the time he died in, in, in 1988, he had uh, made it big in the art world and he mm -hmm. had some money to spend. So he had collected quite a large uh, collection of artifacts. Uh, 160,000 people have, as of today, seen um, these artifacts displayed. This, is, this show is the first organized show by two of his family members, two of Jean-Michel's family members. Um, two of his sisters organized the show, and they're quite artistic themselves. So they built a recreation of the artist childhood home in the building, in, in the Star at Lehigh building. And he's they built a replica of his studio apartment. That's the one we just talked about. That's for wow. rent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's for rent? The studio, <laughs> yeah, the studio, well, the, the real studio apartment in Greenwich Village that uh, Jean-Michel lived in from, um, it, like, I think it was 1983 to 1998. That's for rent uh, right now. And it is for rent um, for uh, let's see, with taxes included, sixty thousand dollars a month. Oh, well, huh? No, no, seventy thousand a month. Oh, Sorry, it just went up, ladies good. and gentlemen. Inflation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an expensive apartment in an wow. expensive location, and owned by one of the greats of the art world, etc. It is available, Richard, if you're interested in moving to Greenwich Village. It's cheap at the price of 70000 Well, anyway, the two sisters, Jean-Michel's two sisters, built a replica of Jean-Michel's childhood home and also of his apartment in the space. Um, and they also uh, have curated a clothing line and a fashion show developed around the canvases, the way that Jean-Michel painted. Um, so... To get that together, they interviewed um, nine uh, nine black fashion talents for the show. And in conjunction with the Black Fashion Fair, they're having an opening at this um, at the Starlet Lay Building in in New York, where you can see Jean Michel's uh, collection of items. You can see his apartment. You can see his childhood home. And you can also see a, um, a couple of runway shows. And I love this title. Um, the, these these nine Black fashion talents have named this, the show Those Who Dressed Those Who Dress Better. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, those who dress better. And some of the fashions are are um, amazing. Um, they have. Uh, uh, if you're going to take a look, if you're interested to see, uh, you can look at the Black Fashion Fairs website where the, some of the fashions are 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 shown. Um, very innovative, an interesting space, all in the style of Jean Michel Basquiat. And you know, he he passed away in, in eight, 1988, a brilliant painter. Mm. The, the the driving force behind this was the estate's desire to support emerging fash black fashion. Um, it, you know, it it was interesting. I had not known that Jean Michel Basquiat was so interesting interested in fashion, but he was, and he was kind of known for a really interesting fashion statement. Um, whenever he was out in public, he would wear this oversized, like a soccer jersey almost, mm. but it was huge. It was almost like a tent on the poor guy. <laughs> um, you know, he, uh, he was famous for his look. He also loved hats and he had this hat that he was sort of a, um, a trademark of his, almost like a, a, a halo around his head. It was like a, a tipped up hat, a tipped up bowler hat like this. Oh. And, and so, um, uh, you know, he had this hat and this jersey. Um, and, you know, that was his own personal style. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, it's really interesting. One of the... Um, one of the designers, the black fashion designers that celebrated in this particular Basquiat show uh, designed a whole dress made of Jersey in, in celebration of Jean-Michel's oh, signature wow. look. And if you want to take a look, it's really interesting to look at the way he painted mm -hmm. and the, how how an artist's two dimensional work it can be translated into fashion. It's a fascinating story. Mm. Anyway, that's a little bit about. Jean-Michel and um, his good friend, Andy Warhol. I was really interested to see that there is a Netflix kind of mini series happening right now. Mm. It's called the Andy Warhol Diaries. Um, it's in season one and it talks about uh, Andy's life through Andy's own words. Basically after Andy, there was a suicide attempt upon his life in 1968 um, and so the, the documentary starts at this point where Andy begins to tell about his life and his feelings after a, you know, brush with death. Um, those, so it's, so it's, you know, Andy reading from his diaries, virtual Andy. And, uh, the idea of the series is to, you know, he was very, very, um, reclusive. He was shy. You wouldn't think that to see his art, but this series aims at um, showing the secrets behind his persona. Very interesting. Take a look. Netflix. It's a very interesting uh, little foray into the mind of a great artist. Richard, let's go to a quick break. I'm going to talk to you about the discovery of a hoard of Viking silver. Ooh. Um, just, a, just shortly out of the borders of Stockholm. It was discovered Viking silver. Cool. Viking. Yeah, Viking ear silver. Thousand years ago. Mm. From thousand years. So return that down. We'll talk about that when we get back from the break. <laughs> Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Here's a message from Tubular George, Santa Barbara's favorite chimney sweep. On chilly evenings, nothing says home sweet home like a glowing fire and a cup of hot cocoa. Gathering your family and friends around the fire is comfy and relaxing. But if you don't like cleaning up ashes or the smoky smell, let Tubular George convert your wood-burning fireplace to a new high-efficiency gas insert. Now, this ain't your mother's old gas insert. The new gas insert burns super hot, super clean, and they come in many styles, from traditional to modern or even city sleek. Enjoy safe and warm evenings by the fire with no mess, no smell, and with plenty of heat. Visit tubulagegeorge.com, tubulagegeorge.com. Call 805-682-5939 for fireplace cleaning and inspections, gas logs, and the new gas inserts. 805-682-5939, 805-682-5939. Merry Christmas to you. 
David. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. Well, uh, what are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. Don't you remember me? Don't you know that we miss you? Miss me? Who misses me? You know, all your friends in the forest. The trees, the pond, that little fort that you made out of branches. We all miss you. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. Oh, I guess that makes sense. The forest is not that far away. Have an adventure today. I'm sure your mom would take you. You're right. I should get out. I want to have fun. Play in puddles, catch frogs, and climb trees. Hey, Mom! Yeah, hon? <gasps> Stephen, what is that in your hand? It's my sense of adventure, Mom. It's telling me we need to get out of the house and have some fun in nature today. Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. All right, here we go. <clears throat> in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. We're talking about the crazy end of the season w- happenings in the art world. We talked a little bit about uh, Van Gogh, the dog that painted, paints still today, the pit bull with one ear that paints in the style of Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> we talked a little bit about Jean-Michel Basquiat's apartment, which was formerly owned by Andy Warhol. Uh, Basquiat passed in 1988. The apartment is up for rent in Greenwich Village for 70000 a month. Uh, and then the show that um, has kind of taken Black fashion fair by storm, it's going on now, the recreation of uh, the artifacts of Jean-Michel's life and the fashion that has been uh, an offshoot of his two-dimensional canvases. Now we want to talk a little bit about a hoard of Viking silver. Now, let's say, Richard, you and I don't know each other, but we um, have a certain signal in how we dress. Mm-hmm. And we signal to the world our status, for example, with how we dress so, uh, among Many things. Um, but a thousand years ago, if you were a Viking, you had a signal of your status and your wealth. And this was sort of like a, a almost a hard metal chain that was forged in a circle that you kind of wore around your neck. It's called a torque. And these are just little like harnesses of, 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 of silver. Hmm. And um, the people of great status in the Viking era uh, wore these, you know, to show their rank. And um, these were found underneath a a part of a building. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, A Swedish National Historical Museum dug beneath the decayed floor of um, of a building that was sort of one of these things like the, the, the a Viking age settlement area. You know, it was a, a, a an area that was cordoned off to the public, but that it was not really a, a tourist site. It wasn't really a, a study site because it was thought there was nothing, nothing there. There was an old building that started to decay. They started to dig that up and they discovered in the floor little bit underneath of the the top layer of dirt, a small ceramic pot. Inside the pot were eight of these neck rings in in silver. Uh, Arm rings were also worn. The Vikings wore arm rings to establish a sense of status. They wore finger rings. They wore pearls, believe it or not. And they wore coins. Uh, They would have these coins that they'd wear in a little pouch, um, sort of on the side of a belt. That was the jewelry of a Viking a, a thousand years ago. And they discovered these remarkable, extraordinarily well-preserved jewels, uh, looking almost completely new. Um, and this is part of a of an excavation taking place at a settlement that that they're now discovering, Swedish archaeologists are now discovering, had endured f- for, well, let's see, 400, 400, it began, 400, the settlement began. 
It flourished between 800 and 1050, and it lasted into the Middle Ages. So this settlement of Vikings began in 400 and you know, had its heyday in, let's say, 1000. It lasted to the Middle Ages, and the archaeologists have discovered 20 houses and buildings underneath the, 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 the rock and stone of the area. They've discovered arrows. Uh, they've discovered quern stones. Quern stones is really interesting. It's spelled Q-U-E-R-N. Quern stones are used to grind things down. So they can be polishing stones. They can be mill stones. They've discovered a number of those. They've discovered a number of amulet rings. What's an amulet ring? Well, you know, it's one of those rings, Richard, where here's the 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 band of, that goes around the finger, and then there's a, a an area on the top of the ring where it there you can store something in there. So it's like a, we used to call them poison rings, but you can open the top of the ring, and, and you get sort of a, a you know a, a, it's a little storage area. They discovered those. Um, Silver, what does owning silver prove? If you were a Viking, what did owning silver prove? Well, it proves that you were very wealthy, and it also proves that you're capable of some advanced craftsmanship. So there was somebody in that village, um, at, gosh, which was established in 400, hmm. 400 AD. Somebody in that village knew how to make uh, and forge silver. You have to mine it. You have to create it. You have to make it into jewelry, etc. cetera. Um, it, you know, it also reflects a certain uh, level of status and uh, a certain level of um, beauty. Uh, and what, con what, 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 what the Vikings thought of is beautiful. Um, we also mentioned that they wore these coins in a little pouch. They weren't their own coins. What they were, they were collections of coins from their journeys. Now, they were seafaring people. And the coins that they find show the international nature of the commerce in Viking Age Scandinavia. So we're talking pre-1000 AD. The Vikings were traveling to England, Bohemia, Bavaria, and the Arab countries. Because they have coins from those countries in their in their pouches. It's amazing to think that, you know, between 400 AD and 1000 AD, that these seafaring people actually went that far. England, Bohemia, Bavaria, and the Arab countries. Uh, they they found a 10th century coin minted in Normandy, an area in northern France to which the Vikings migrated in the in the ninth century. Um, we didn't really know that they had another settlement in Normandy uh, until we actually discovered this coin. And then the coin pointed because of where it was minted. It pointed to the area in which the Vikings had a settlement in Normandy. That's in France. So, uh, you know, the, it, it, it's amazing to think in that era, this is pre-Middle Ages. Uh, in that era, there was such an uh, such an incredible um network viking commerce network um you know the the vikings used to bury also along with uh, a, a funeral they used to bury their most valuable uh, possessions and you know people have always thought that vikings had what they call a funeral pyre you know they mm -hmm. would burn things and that isn't the case the artifacts were buried with some of the 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 the, the bodies and they're finding that um, right now, the artifacts that they're discovering are on their way to Conservation Center in Stockholm, a very recent discovery. And Richard, I want to show you, uh, I wish, dear listener, you could see, I'm going to show Richard uh, uh, the coin, the, nor the coin that was owned by Vikings and minted in Normandy. See, there's the coin. Oh, this wow. Is a, yeah. This coin is um, over a thousand years old. <sighs> Yeah, and it was found wow. in the cache uh, of the Viking settlement, one of the earliest settlements of Vikings ever discovered. When we get back from the break, Richard, I'm going to tell you about a site also that they've discovered in um, 
in in uh well what shall we say Oman uh it, it's a, a a decade of digging has resulted in an amazing find in the Arabian Peninsula and um the Oman Ministry of Heritage and Tourism has just released details on what's been unearthed I love archaeology and I was thinking gosh this is such an interesting counterbalance to the Viking horde because this is exactly on the other side of the of the world uh, so when we get back from the break, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this discovery in the Arabian Peninsula of a very, very, very old settlement. And we're talking much older than the Viking settlement. We're talking the settlement happened between 2600 and 2000 BC. Wow. We're talking, you know, four to 5,000 years ago. And we're discovering a very ancient settlement uh, in the Arabian Pen Peninsula just this past week. Okay, let's go to a quick break. Back to talk about the archaeology of this particularly fantastic discovery, 5,000 year, year in, the, in the ground. Don't turn that down. When it's time to clean your carpets, you should know that some carpet cleaners can leave harmful toxins in your home or office. That's why Wallace Cleaning Company created the four-step cleaning process that uses state-of-the-art equipment and environmentally safe, non-toxic solutions to clean your carpets with your satisfaction guaranteed and your safety in mind. Since 1979, Wallace Cleaning Company has been the Santa Barbara area's premier choice for quick, quiet, efficient, and safe carpet cleaning that dries in two hours or less. When it's time to clean your carpets at home or office, it's time to call a name you can trust at a price you can afford. It's time to call 967-1860 to talk to the pros at Wallace Cleaning Company, where no job is too big or too small. Wallace Cleaning Company, 967-1860. Learn more about the affordable four-step cleaning process that cleans your carpets with your safety in mind. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Here's a message from Tubular George, Santa Barbara's favorite chimney sweep. On chilly evenings, nothing says home sweet home like a glowing fire and a cup of hot cocoa. Gathering your family and friends around the fire is comfy and relaxing. But if you don't like cleaning up ashes or the smoky smell, let Tubular George convert your wood-burning fireplace to a new high-efficiency gas insert. Now this ain't your mother's old gas insert. The new gas insert burns super hot, super clean, and they come in many styles, from traditional to modern or even city sleek. Enjoy safe and warm evenings by the fire with no mess, no smell, and with plenty of heat. Visit tubularGeorge.com, tubularGeorge.com. Call 805-682-5939 for fireplace cleaning and inspections, gas logs, and the new gas inserts, 805-682-5939, 805-682-5939. Merry Christmas to you. Stand by. Three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. Now we're talking about this as 2022 winds down. We're talking about the really interesting discoveries just this past month in the art world. And, and uh, I consider, you know, some of the archaeological finds uh, that they've just discovered this year also uh, art itself. We're talking about this culture. It's called the Um Al Nar culture. Um, and it, it, it flourished in the area we call Oman in the Arabian Peninsula from 2600 to 2000 BC. Um, that was the heyday. It was established earlier than that. And they represent this, this, this the dig sites. They're finding structures that represent the oldest permanent settlement um, almost in the world. It's it's quite amazing. It's, it's 300 kilometers west in Abu Dhabi and uh, the area became a UNESCO site in 2012, and they've been uh, quietly unearthing these structures ever since then. Um, it's the most important early Bronze Age settlement during because they found so many uh, quality archaeological finds. Um, 
they, they discovered also the timeline of the culture that lived there. Uh, and they've discovered through the buildings, they're discovering ways to understand its the, the, the villagers' economic situation and social functions because certain buildings were certain were uh, bigger, better, et cetera. Certain buildings had dedicated um, themes for them. The discovery proves that the peoples of the Bronze Age were more intelligent and technologically advanced than we ever previously thought, says Jonathan Mark Kinnaware, the expert from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who announced the discovery. At an early stage, these people introduced management solutions to the village and its economy. You know, it's, it's amazing to think that this 5,000 years ago, these people had a flourishing vi village with an economic structure and a social structure, et cetera, in the Bronze Age. Um, what do these buildings include, Richard? Well, they include warehouse, uh, uh, many warehouses, industrial copper processing factories, administrative offices, and religious buildings. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. They've unearthed human skeletons in the burial sites. Um, they've unearthed pottery from quite a ways away. Wow. Amongst the most important and distinguishing tools from this tomb are the remains of also silver jewelry, just like we talked about with the Vikings. Silver jewelry and silver beads uh, that form, you know, necklaces and rings, for example, uh, one silver ring carries the engraved seal of an Indian cow that was known in the Indus Valley. N not not in this area at all. Hmm. Um, seals and soapstone uh, have been found. You know, to to um, let's say you you you're going to 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 write a tablet in in clay. You know, this is called cuneiform, and you put your own seal on that. These seals are made in soapstone, but they're made in Turkey. And then, you know, we're talking, this is on the Arab Peninsula where they've been found. So we're talking 5,000 years ago, this um, settlement, a massive uh, village has been found that was a fully functioning uh, society that traveled that traded internationally and, and that had copper and silver producing almost factories. It, it's fascinating to think about that 5,000 years ago that this was actually a village that flourished this way. Yeah. Richard, I think we could, do we have to go to one more quick break? Yeah, we do have one more, sure. All right, so let's go to one quick break and then we get back up. There's been a, a countdown uh, in the art world, the art world is celebrating some of the, of the big leaders of 2022 that will be um, leading some famous art organizations in 2023. And I want to just tell you a few of them. I've got six or so to mention to you. Uh, for example, the, the new leader of the um, Mellon Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, that gives so much money to art and artists over periods of the past uh, 100 years. Uh, so people like that that are leading the art world as far as the foundations and the and the money that the art world kind of has come to expect. Don't turn that dial back in a sec. This is the place that talks about Santa Barbara. I'm Ben Hayes in the News Center. Steve Cates, Dr. Sky. I'm Donnie Risden. I'm Ed Geron. I'm Maria Long. I'm Mark Schneidman. Louis Jones. I'm Diane Duba. My name's Andy Caldwell. I'm Erica, the Queen of Keen. I'm Scott Dweck. I'm Mike Williams. I'm Ted Adams. I'm Guy Rivera. I'm Michael Self. I'm Steve Forcell. I'm Jim Williams. I'm Dale Francisco. I'm Tom Woodrow. I'm Eloy Ortega. I'm Earl Armstrong. I'm Neil Chrysell. I am Sam Edelman. I'm Martha Von Wiesenberger. I'm Martha Bull. I am your host, Jeremiah. I'm Elizabeth Stewart. Hi, I'm Chris Cullen. I'm Lisa Cullen. And I'm Leanna Finley. Drew Wakefield. I'm Mark Giles. John Martinet. I'm Richard Morgan. It's TV's Tim Stack. KCSB, the Santa Barbara News Press radio station. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
When a bank is owned by the community and invests in the community, it answers to a different call. It's personal. It's driven by your needs, not ours. Welcome to American Riviera Bank, based right here in Santa Barbara with branches in Montecito and Goleta. Our customers know us for personal service every day, every way. You can bank on us. Bank on us. Bank on us! American Riviera Bank. Bank on better. Hey, son, how are you feeling? Um, uh, I'm fine, Pops. What's on your mind? I just, I can't explain it. Navigating, without a compass, eyes waiting, started to wonder. Metamorphosis, the loss of who you thought you is. When your kid can't find the language, help them find the lyrics. Listen to the Sound It Out album and get tips and tools to start a conversation at sounditouttogether.org. Brought to you by Ad Council and Pivotal Ventures. Stand by. Three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. We're talking about the wonderful things that have just happened in the art world. 2022 is drawing to a close, and there's been a lot of um, changes in some of the big organizations, the big museums, the big foundations across the country. Um, a poet, scholar, and president now, just elected president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, she had a career in poetry and African-American studies, and she's very unusual to be leading uh, this organization. The organization gives away $250 million a year to the art world. And um, it, it, what he what she's interested in 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 having the Mellon Foundation look at in the future is such a controversy in the art world. Our public, you know, public public art. So you know the the statues, the the um the the those sorts of things, the 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 markers of our history. She's interested in that, and she's interested in revisioning those. It, and for example, in, in diverse communities, she's thinking strongly about the Black community. She's thinking strongly about the Puerto Rican community. Uh, it's very interesting because the, the head of the Mellon Foundation is a very powerful position. Um, here's another great one. The curator, uh, a curator um, who is recently appointed, um, He's appointed to the University of California, Berkeley and Columbia University. He's curating for both universities and he is not, he doesn't have a background in art. He has a background of teaching literature and he is doing a show right now on Joan Didion at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, and that's so interesting because she's a literary uh, artist. But this is a curated store, uh, story of her life in an art museum. Um, and so, you know, what he's doing is is Hilton Owls is his name. Is he saying, well, this is art, too. Um, I think it's fascinating. This is another uh, wonderful leader, managing director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Bangkok. Um, Kit Bench Aronkul. He recently took the reins of this really important museum. He's done an ice rink uh, for the museum <laughs> in the main entrance. Uh, he's done a 10th anniversary show for artists between the ages of 6 and 17 who have been scouted on social media. Um, really different, interesting. Great galleries such as the gallery that he's curating is uh, their businesses, he says, that support great artists. They And they can come from anywhere. The artists can come from anywhere. And he has also done a great job with the museums. Uh, like we say, he's got a, an ice rink in the entryway <laughs> to attract people. And it's really working beautifully. Um, a new CEO of Art Basel. Those of you who have seen Art Basel in Miami or Switzerland, et cetera, you know it's the art world's biggest fair of the year. We have a new director, Noel Horowitz. Uh, and he actually has come down to Art Basel from Sotheby's Auction House. And then he recently took on the the the, the took on a, a, a role at Art Basel 
not the CEO, but he did so well that he is now the CEO. What he says is, I like the role of the of, of Art Basel greatly. I like the hands-on. I like the current event platforms. I want to do more. He's got Basel, Miami, Hong Kong, and Paris right now, and he wants to branch Art Basel into greater fields. And you know, George Lucas has a museum. I didn't know this. The Lucas Museum of Narrative Art has a new director, Sandra Jackson Dumont. Um, she's done public programs at the Seattle Art Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and now she's doing a, this perspective to the George Lucas uh, and Melody Hobson's Lucas Museum. This is slated to open in Los Angeles in 2025. How interesting, a museum of narrative art. She's the new curator there. The Lucas Museum, George Lucas's museum has an interdisciplinary collection of more than 100,000 pieces of visual storytelling. I think that's fantastic. Visual storytelling, including film, graphic design, paintings, art, high profile portraits, uh, you know, what Lucas wanted to do was carve out a place for narrative art. Uh, narrative art is not always thought of as fine art. It's very interesting because we talk about film and graphic design and storytelling. It's not necessarily thought of in the great museums of the past as fine art. That's changing. Um, and Lucas is saying narrative art shapes how we see the world. Um and the new director, Sandra Jackson Dumont, says, I'm loving that we're building an institution that centers on how we see the world. Hmm. Fantastic. Look for that. The Lucas Museum opening in Los Angeles in 2025. Um, and it's going to be quite interesting. The shape of it, the architectural features of it, it's sort of like a big football on its side. Very interesting. Um, and Richard, that's what's happening in the art world at the moment. To end the show and maybe end the year, I want to tell you a little bit about this. Um, some fa famous quotes from some of these people that are, are shaping the art world of, of the of this day. We talked about some of the new new hires. Um, quotes. Noel Horowitz, who now who now runs Art Basel, said this: "I don't believe in career advice per se. I believe in life advice." Perhaps the best piece of life advice was from my father to remember that even though we need our work, we should take pride in our work. We should always remember if there is, Richard, listen to this, if there is something unsafe or soul killing about our work, then we should get out. Mm. Elizabeth Alexander, who is running the Mellon Foundation, says, if you're mulling over something, just keep saying yes. Yes to that interview. Yes to that meeting. Yes, yes, yes. Until you say, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and Sandra Jackson Dumont, who's running the new Lucas Museum for Narrative Art, very interesting, opening in 2025, say, says this, stay curious, never stop learning, and ask for help. Mm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, right. thanks, Richard. You thanks, bet. Richard, and happy holidays and happy 2023 to everybody out there. All right, you are clear. Yeah, kind of fun, huh? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let me stop the...